what every scientist, what every Adventist scientist should know, erosional features. We've been going through a series on what every Adventist scientist should know, and in most cases it's what every Christian scientist should know as well. Christian and scientist being two different words, of course. Uh, first we talked about the philosophy of science. We will eventually get into the question of whether there is a God. Um, we have been doing, uh, have been uh, going through some issues on how old is life on Earth and was there a flood. We talked about carbon-14 dating. We talked about uranium lead dating. Today we're going to be talking about erosional features with special attention to the Brett's flood or floods. Um, Next week we'll be talking about rates of erosion. Eventually we'll be talking about paraconformities um, and soft sediment def deformation. And um, we'll be talking about paleocurrence and widespread layers. We will also talk about some uh, items that are often used to argue for long age for life on Earth, such things as the Coconina sandstone, the Yellowstone fossil forest, ice cores, and radiometric dating. And finally, because we're Adventists and we have Ellen White in our background, we'll talk about Ellen White's health messages in general and also uh, her messages in particular about alcohol. Erosional features. First, I'm going to talk about uniformitarianism, the general concept. Then we're going to talk about the Brett's flood or floods. Then we're going to talk about further recognized evidence of flooding that is fairly recent, further unrecognized evidence of flooding, and uh, my own interim conclusion, which of course is not a final one, but uh, does try to recognize evidence we have, and then you get to chime in. Uniformitarianism. Um, first easily was documented by James Hutton in Theory of the Earth, or an investigation of the laws observable in the composition, dissolution, and restoration of land upon the globe, which is an article published in Transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, printed in 1788, although it was actually presented in 1785. Why the three years difference, I'm not sure. In that, he wrote, from what has actually been, we have data for concluding with regard to that which is to happen thereafter. Now, interestingly enough, um, um, Hutton was a f good friend, a close friend of uh, David Hume. And David Hume asked that question as to whether we could trust the past to be uh, uh, like the present and seems to have said if we're going to do that, we have to postulate it rather than to be able to prove it. That's, of course, from a philosopher, and proof has a higher standard there. The result, therefore, of our present inquiry, of course, this is James Hutton again, is that we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. So he's one of the first that had very long ages probably the first that was published and well-known. This was also argued for by Charles Lyell, and you can see it right in the title of his book, Principles of Geology, being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. It was published originally in Volume 1 in 1830, Volume 2 in 1832, and Volume 3 in 1833. And in that he's famous for saying the present is the key to the past. He meant that in two senses. Number one, actions which are not in the present cannot be extrapolated to the past. But he also meant that rates comparable to present rates are only, there are the only rates that are allowed in the past as well. In other words, not only is the general process the same, but the rates are the same. And this was fairly well accepted teaching in geology for a long time. This, of course, rules out any massive floods. And 
I think in their mind positively, it included the Genesis flood. That couldn't be real, or at least it couldn't be worldwide. In fact, it couldn't be more than a local flood of the same kind that we have today. <coughs> now, there were several things going on in um, Washington State that didn't always fit. There were potholes, channels that suddenly would have a giant hole in them. Well, you see this <coughs> in rivers, but they're maybe three or four feet in diameter. Six to eight is pretty big. Um, but these, these things are like 30, 40 feet across. There are erratic boulders, boulders that came from somewhere else, mostly uh, back in the uh, Montana area, <coughs> that uh, just sitting there in the middle of fields for no good reason. Uh, some of them were angular suggesting they hadn't been just rolled into place because when you do that to a rock, you kind of knock off the, the angles. There was flooding of the Willamette Valley, which was discovered in 1871 for no obvious reason. Um, Bretz did most of his research on foot, which handicapped him in, ab in being able to see some things. Um, but he did notice anastomosing channels and he did notice hills that seemed to be streamlined as if water had flowed around them. Uh, there were giant gravel bars, sometimes uh, more than gravel, uh, deposited as if by a giant stream, except that this stream would have had to have been flowing extremely rapidly in order to pick up that kind of gravel. He wrote some papers in 1923, the first one being somewhat cautious, and the second one arguing for a great flood. He didn't know where the water came from. He wondered if maybe the glaciers that had covered the uh, 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 the northern reaches of uh, Montana, Idaho, Washington State, and British Columbia, and had suddenly melted, perhaps, and that's where all the water came from. Or perhaps there had been a volcano that had melted the, the uh, water. But he kept noticing things like hanging valleys. Most valleys, the streams come down to meet the river. In these valleys, the streams came up and then suddenly dropped into a canyon. And he wrote two more papers. Now, Bretz was, in fact, a uniformitarian. But he looked at these things and he said, maybe it's the same general cause, but it certainly is not the same rate. There was a meeting in 1927 when he presented his findings and argued for them. At the meeting was a gentleman by the name of Alden, who is a very cautious fellow, a gentleman by the name of Meinzer, who is the father of modern hydrology, Galilei, McKnight, and Mansfield. Galilei had studied under Bretz in high school, so these people knew each other. And Meinzer had been examined by Bretz during his PhD thesis finals. Um, it's inter of interest that we do have some comments by Meinzer during this meeting. And uh, Meinzer said, after Britz's proposal, the Columbia River is a very large stream, especially in its flood stages, and it was undoubtedly still larger in the Pleistocene epoch. This is when glaciers were melting. Its erosive work in the Grand Coulee and Quincy Valley, impressive though it is, appears to me about what would be expected from a stream of such size when diverted from its valley and poured for a long time over a surface of considerable relief that was wholly unadjusted to it. The dry falls in the Grand Coulee resemble Niagara Falls and are evidently the product of normal stream work. 
The dry gorges of the coulee below the dry falls was apparently excavated by the same orderly and long-continued process of head-end erosion as the gorge below Niagara Falls, and it could hardly have been produced in a short time by a flood of whatever magnitude. Having seen only this part of the region in which I believe the existing features can be explained by assuming normal stream work of the ancient Columbia River, I'm naturally loath to accept a theory of an abnormal flood for the Scablands farther east. Before a theory that requires a seemingly impossible quantity of water is fully accepted, every effort should be made to account for the existing features without employing <coughs> so violent an assumption. I think you can catch the reticence with which people approached the idea of a giant flood. Joseph P. Uh, T. Pardee was also in the meeting and he is reported to have turned to Kirk Bryan and said, I know where Brett's flood came from. Now he didn't say anything out loud, possibly partly because Alden was Pardee's boss and was coming down on the opposite side. And um, if you know which side your bread is buttered on, sometimes you just don't say anything. In 1932, Brett's temporarily quit publishing. Um, and there's, a, there's an excellent uh, movie that was made by Nova, which is not exactly a, um, a creationist organization. Um, that's called Mystery of the Mega Flood, and I'm going to try to play some of it for you. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to show you some slides of some of the things that are quite interesting. First, this is Chemist Prairie from the air. This is actually just a picture from MapQuest. You can do this yourself at home. And you can see ripple marks. The only problem is that that section is two miles. So these are ripple marks that are close to two miles wide. And you can see they extend all the way down to here. And they're, you know, what, six, eight miles there? Um, then uh, here's some more of them that's closer to the original outlet. And you can see where uh, there was uh, current flowing from here, current flowing from here, and how they got, in, got mixed in. You can. What the Camas Prairie in Montana? Not uh, too far from where I, uh, where my mother grew up. She lived in Lone Pine, which is up north, just a little ways. Here's a pothole. Um, I got this from HugeFloods.com, and they have a whole bunch of stuff that's just fascinating. If you have the chance, look at their uh, their stuff, and. To get an idea of how big that pothole is, there's a man. That's big. Um, here is an aerial shot of Washington. Actually, this is, I think, a satellite picture. And you can see the drainage pattern here. It looks like a stream bed that's kind of uh, braided and, you know, gone around islands and so forth. Here are some of those strange looking uh, hills that are streamlined and you can kind of imagine water flowing around them and in a, one or two cases here possibly through them as well. And you can see they're kind of boat shaped. Here's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and you know it's it's very easy to imagine that being caused by a massive flood that went through and, and took out the topsoil everywhere else and left the topsoil in these areas here. Here's dry falls that they were referring to that kind of reminds you a little bit of the Horseshoe Falls, the Canadian Falls at Niagara. Um, just a minute, I'll show you some of that. You can see these kind of rounded uh, things that come up, leave, sometimes will leave a uh, something uh, behind them that just stands out. This is Steamboat Rock. And you can see uh, other kind of 
uh, horseshoe-shaped falls coming out here and one over here. This, by the way, uh, is the Grand Coulee in Washington State. And here's, uh, just for a comparison, this is Niagara Falls, this is a Canadian side, and you can see that it's kind of this same horseshoe shape. And you can see the American side is, uh, is a little bit straighter across, but it doesn't have quite as much water flowing by it. When geologists finally recognized, oh, wait a minute, before I do that, I should just pause now and uh, see if I can play that clip for you. It, I won't play the whole movie, obviously, because if I do that, uh, will take the whole time, and that's not quite fair, but... Um During the 1920s, a geologist named J. Harlan Bretz outlined a theory of what he thought had really happened to the Scablands. But Bretz's theory defied all scientific convention. He claimed the scab lands were not the result of a slow geological evolution, but of an enormous catastrophe that had happened almost overnight. For years, Brett's traveled the scab lands examining the landscape. Eventually, one feature would clinch his argument, although it would take him decades to recognize it. From ground level, these shapes don't make much sense. Bretz must have walked over thousands of those things, but they're so big in the field he had no idea what they were. He just, uh, he, didn't, he didn't guess what they were. Bretz would not see aerial photographs of these hills for many years. But we can see from the air how these shapes begin to look like ripples, a giant version of the ripples left behind on the beach by the sea. Even without this key observation, the years Brett spent patiently examining rocks and other features of the Scablands convinced him only a vast volume of water could account for all the evidence. In his mind, the entire landscape which had once been a flat plateau, was created in a single giant flood. But as Bretz well knew, his geological colleagues, understanding that the Earth was billions of years old, firmly believed that landscapes such as the Scablands must have gradually formed over long periods of time. It was this orthodox view that Brett's now seemed to be challenging. Since the 1820s, geologists had come to think on good evidence that landform, most landforms and most deposits on Earth had formed over long periods of time by ordinary processes of rivers and ocean waves and what have you. Brett's comes and offers this immense catastrophe, altering a landscape essentially overnight. And it was just didn't square with the way geology had been put together at the time. On the 12th of January, 1927, Bretz prepared to address a specially convened meeting of fellow scientists in Washington, D.C. This was his big chance to sell his outlandish theory. The 423rd meeting of the Geological Society of Washington is now called to order. Bretz was proposing something completely unheard of. A body of water up to 900 feet deep, raging through the scablands and then flowing off into the Pacific Ocean. Over 500 cubic miles of water, great flow depths. Now, no gradual process is responsible for this landscape. I am forced by the field evidence by what I have observed with my own eyes to come to this hypothesis. It is clear from my field evidence that the Columbia River, swollen inside, 
could easily have cut dry falls. And deposited to any self-respecting geologist, this sounded too much like a biblical flood. They dismissed Brett's out of hand. This did not happen overnight, but over many thousands of years. To suggest otherwise is ludicrous. The implication was very clearly that Bretz was committing a kind of heresy and that he should listen to these elder statesmen of the science and rethink his uh, hypothesis. Even if you were convinced by his unbelievable idea, Brett still had a problem. Where did the water come from? And Bretz can't tell them where the water came from. It's one of the big problems with, with the whole idea. To convince his colleagues, Bretz needed a source. How could so much water, traveling at ferocious speeds, suddenly appear out of thin air? No one among the top geologists gathered that day could imagine a source for this heretical flood. Well, almost no one. Sitting in the audience is J.T. Pardee. Uh, Pardee supposedly leans over to a colleague and says, I know where Brett's water came from. That this formation... But it would be more than a decade before Pardee revealed his secret. During that time, Brett's remained firmly in the geological wilderness. That's interesting that when uh, geologists finally recognized that there had been a flood and uh, Brett's basically won the day uh, by 1965 uh, or so. <clears throat> then they started noticing multiple floods that had done it instead of one big one. Because this must have happened several times, 20 times, 40 times. Um, multiple floods were apparently demanded by ash from Mount St. Helens partway through Rhythmites in, among other places, Burlingame Canyon in the Walla Walla Valley. The ash does seem to be intercalated with sand and silt, which raises the question maybe it wasn't just um, uh, a single deposit, but perhaps uh, was being deposited at the same time. So Mount St. Helens may have gone off uh, during the flood. Here's a picture of some of that intercalated sand and silt. And you can see that it splits into two layers here with the regular uh, deposits on either side of it. The rhythmites gradually decrease inside from the bottom, which is two meters, uh, to the top, which is about 10 centimeters, which suggests that Whatever the process was, it was doing so in a gradually decreasing size. So either we have to assume that the first flood was the biggest and then the other floods were smaller, or else we can assume that what happened was that uh, water was sloshing in and sloshing out um, in one large flood. And I suppose that um, how you view that depends on what your uh, prior probabilities are in that situation. Uh, it is of interest that scouring or tearing up of the, the material underneath these deposits only happens at the bottom, which is kind of unusual if this is something that is um, happening at various times, say 50 years apart or something like that. Uh, clastic dikes can cut through the entire sequence, which seems to indicate that they may have been soft at the same time. Uh, to be fair, I think there are some reports of mud cracks and, um, and uh, burrows that appear to have been filled with uh, material from above. So there is that argument that there may have been multiple floods. 
in Iceland, there's a glacial flood um, that caused 300 rhythmites in 17 hours. So it can be done very rapidly. And their total depth was 15 meters with a much smaller volume of water than what is uh, uh, what uh, came from the Missoula flood. And uh, you can see that the, that the uh, size of them are somewhat comparable. So that raises the question, maybe it was only one flood. Um, Rhythmite is something, it's a deposit that's laid down uh, one after another after another as if there's some kind of rhythm to it. And there are a few of them out in um, uh, southeastern California in the desert that we've, we've been to on a field trip before. So they're deposited in various areas. Um, some people will say it happens every two weeks or something like that when it's flood, uh, when it's, uh, the tides come in. Um, but at least in Iceland, you can see them forming in uh, 17 hours. Close to Wallula Gap, there may actually have been more than one flood. The Lake Bonneville flood, which apparently that, those deposits are underneath the Missoula flood. There's now been evidence of this same kind of flooding happening in Siberia, apparently by the same mechanism. Uh, we're discovering that there's quite a few of these floods. Of interest to me is that Brett's flood initially, and uh, for many people still, is viewed as an exception, not the way things normally happen. Now, there has been further recognized evidence of flooding um, some formations seem to cry out as being flooded. It just looks obvious. However, in spite of Brett's example, geologists generally do not consider massive flooding as a possibility. It takes them a long time to figure this out. The Brett's flood has been common knowledge since the 1960s. About 1965, it's pretty well been agreed that he was right. But in 2008, that's... Um, what, 50 years later? Um, we just discovered another flood. I'm going to, uh, uh, some 50 years after the general recognition of the Missoula flood, evidence for another flood has finally been recognized. And it's an article in Science in 2008 called Formation of Box Canyon, Idaho by Mega Flood. Implications for seepage erosion on Earth and Mars. And um, we're talking about some place that's between Boise and Twin Falls. And uh, that little area on the map that I've just outlined, we're going to enlarge that. And if you look right here, you'll see something strange there. Let me just enlarge that. And you can see something that looks kind of like a snake. Only thing of it is, it's a snake that is gouged out. And there's another snake right next to it. Now this one has generally been assumed to have been carved out by a flood or floods because it can't do it itself. But this one has a big spring in it that runs, there, well, you can take a look at it, uh, the head of the snake a little bit better. Um, and there's the end of Blind Canyon, which just kind of stops. But Box Canyon actually has that spring. And uh, let's just back out a little bit. And uh, Box Canyon was initially thought to be the result of seepage erosion. That is, there's a spring in there with 10 cubic meters per second. Just for reference sake, a cubic meter is a metric ton of water, which is 1.1 regular tons. Uh, and so we're looking at 10 tons of water per second coming out of that spring. That's a pretty good sized spring. And it was thought that this had gradually eroded this thing. What the study found was the spring, unfortunately, was not fast enough to gouge that thing out. 
The spring only flowed 22 times too slow to transport the basalt that's been taken out of there. There are three plunge pools, which uh, we'll take a look at them. There's one, there's another one, and there's another one even closer. And there's a scoured notch that we'll be looking at next. The notch in that wall has abrasions that look like it's been a, not only eroded, but eroded differentially over the top of it. Um, in fact, you find those abrasions, or scar, scour as you could call it, in a number of different other places in the canyon. Here, here, here. The estimated flow is 800 to 2,800 cubic meters per second. That's a lot of water. The estimated time is somewhere between 35 and 160 days. The rain requirement to make that work is 1.7 meters. And this is in an area where the average annual precipitation is 22 centimeters annually. And it's even worse than that. They raise the question of whether this is a flood from the Big Lost River, and maybe I can show you why that's so weird. Is because the Big Lost River is out here flowing into a sink that uh, kind of just absorbs it. Uh, the Blind Canyon area drainage is here. The Box Canyon area drainage is here. In order to get that kind of a flood, you have to get something into the Blind Canyon area enough to overflow the boundary between the Blind Canyon and the Box Canyon. That's a lot of water. There's a Little Wood River that would have drained water that came over here. And this, the Snake River itself, of course, would have drained water that was beyond the Box Canyon or Blind Canyon area drainage area. That's, I mean, if you think about it, that's just, that implies a huge flood. There's something else that's interesting. This is, if it will stop for me. Um, let's see if it will do that again. Yes. The top one happens to be the Box Canyon, and this is one on Mars, which is a little bit smaller, but um, it's rather amazing how close the two of them are. This is, um, that is now recognized as being due to a flood. I don't think there's anybody that really disputes it anymore. But I'm going to argue that there are further evidences of flooding that are not recognized by the literature, and I'm going to show some of them to you. This is, of course, controversial. You're not going to find this in the, uh, in the literature, but I'm going to ask you to look at these formations with your own eyes and remember that the experts have been wrong previously and see what you think. And also remember, where did the water come from was the clinching argument for the wrong side in the case of the Brett's floods. Take a look at this. You have rounded canyons with a wall kind of rem reminiscent of steamboat rock between them. The only problem is that's the headland. If I put them together, it'll be easier for you to see the whole thing. Where did that water come from? Now this one points off in another direction, implying that water may have come in from, um, you're looking south, so it would have come in from the south, at least for part of it. Uh, here is a uh, uh, Google map, and it's really hard to see there. Uh, pardon me, this is MapQuest. Uh, it's hard to see there, but perhaps if we enlarge it a little bit, it'll be easier to see. That's the formation you're looking at. And water would have had to come up through here and drain off into this general area. Of interest, 
on the other side of this little, this high divide here, you see more of the same kind of formations. Where did the water come from? There's another one, there's another one. And in a little bit, we're going we're gonna to see the second one here, uh, a photo of it as we're driving across the, uh, the high point there. I'm going to turn it upside down it, because it, uh, the reason for that is that uh, we're, we're going to, uh, this direction is now south because most of us are used to having things lighted from above. And of course, it's lighted from the south, so this will make the dark corners, and it'll probably be easier to see exactly how it uh, lies there. And here on the other side are these other two that we were talking about. Um, a little uh, greater enlargement, and again, you can see this one on this side, and you can see what I, what I call Bigfoot because it kind of looks like that. Um, here's another shot of it that perhaps it makes it easier to see. The photo that we had before was from about that area there. And you can see, I think pretty clearly, that this is eroded. Looks like it looks like it's a oh, massive water. But in that case, we're talking about this very strange water. Um, there is the photo of the one we were talking about. This is actually as we're driving by in the bus and we didn't stop and so I had to just shoot the best I could. But you can see that it, it has that characteristic rounded area as if water had poured into it and giving you kind of the Niagara Falls effect. There's more of those. You can see them in the Grand Canyon. In fact, what's particularly interesting is if you look at this very carefully, you will notice that the drainage goes away from the canyon wall. That is to say, at present, the ground slopes away from the wall, which means that you can't have little tiny streams eating this down. It does kind of remind you of some of those other patterns, doesn't it? Some more of the same kind of thing. You'll see this all over. Um, in uh, near Page, I was flying over it on the way out of uh, another time, and uh, uh, this is what it looks like south of the airport. And if you just, you know, you glance at it, you see a pattern that kind of gives you a northwest to southeast uh, orientation for this kind of stuff. And that's true not only at Page, but in some other areas too. Here you can see uh, an island that seems to have been elongated. Um, here's one that you can see the natural drainage is running this way. But the formations are all northeast to southwest. I've taken um, Monument Valley and reversed it so that it looks like it's lighted from the top, but you can see, again, you get this effect of the, of the islands being oriented in general in the northeast to southwest, and what's even more interesting is if you look at, if you look at the, uh, what looks like debris it tends to be all going that way. Since I've turned it around, that's actually southwest. You can see there's more of this kind of light-colored stuff on the, on the lee of that than there is in the front, suggesting that we've got quite a bit of water. Uh, this is a photo of the monitor in the Merrimack. Uh, this is taken on tour. That's me. That's uh, Ariel Roth, is, I believe, right there. Um, and some other people that some of you may know. Uh, 
the photo is not that for that, but it's because it's the only one I have the monitor in the Merrimack behind it, so you can get an idea of how tall they are. And this is what they look like if you're looking at them from above. And uh, you can see that, that they are oriented in the same general direction. Um, here they are again. There's, there's the monitor in the Merrimack right there, but you can see that there's quite a few other formations that are sticking up too. And they're oriented in, again, this kind of northeast to southwest direction. <coughs> Here's another interesting uh, erosional feature. And this is uh, spider rock in Canyon de Chez. It's spelled C-H-E-L-L-E-Y. It's a French, and that's why it's pronounced that way. But here you can see the canyon itself, spider rock in the middle, a large separated rock and then you'll notice all around the canyon are those amphitheaters of the same general kind as what you see in uh, the Grand Canyon with no drainage to make them go and they're not v-shaped they're more of a kind of a u-shaped uh, in some of these places you can actually find um, Erratic, they're not usually boulders, they're usually more like gravel on the top. You can find potholes and a few things like that. So it suggests that there may be more uh, a flood water than... Uh, uh. Now again, where does the water come from? That's the problem. That's spider rock. Now, um, you can go to Google Earth and you can fly around anywhere you want to and look at all the formations if you want to. So anybody can do this. It doesn't take a degree. Uh, admittedly, we're amateurs. Um, but I would point out that they're amateurs. Their training is in another f area, explaining everything by long ages. And at least some of it is wrong. In geology, I think we are where medicine was about 150 years ago, and it's not so much that we didn't have knowledge as it is that we have firm but wrong hypotheses. And, you know, after the Brett's flood, this time we've got it right, well, and then we find flooding in Siberia, well, now we've got it right, and then we find out that in Idaho there's a massive flood, this time we've got it right. Sooner or later, you know, you have to ask, well, maybe they don't know as much as they think they do. <laughs> I would uh, leave you with uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For as it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. I, I wonder if this might be a concrete example of that mm -hmm. text. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, we have a comment from way in the back of the room. <coughs> So are there um, at least three sort of forms uh, for canyons? One, well, I suppose you have glacier as well, but um, one would be where there's flooding, like you've shown. One where it's just sort of a, um, a branch tree sort of pattern of rain coming down everywhere and just sort of eroding like that. But also another pattern in which you have rainfall in a distant area, and then you have a river that's eating out uh, the bottom and just by material dropping down as the base is eroded, um, would that be another distinct type? And if so, what would that type look like? Well, that's one of the problems that we have is that nobody's really worked those things out well. And, you know, seeing that we have this kind of thing, <laughs> it raises the question as to whether um, maybe uh, some of the stuff that we've always assumed has been uh, caused by standard erosion may not be caused by standard erosion. 
Maybe even some of the V-shaped valleys are just simply ones where things drained off kind of more slowly, and so there was more time for uh, the river to cut uh, the standard. Uh, whereas in, in some cases, uh, and perhaps if you have more rain, uh, you can finish the job a little bit better, get more of a V. Um, my sense is that most of the time when you have these kinds of uh, uh, U-shaped and, uh, you know, or almost square valleys, um, that they tend to be in drier areas where perhaps there hasn't been as much erosion after the flood, and so it shows a little better. So now isn't this uh, entirely, entirely amenable to uh, sort of sandbox experiments where you take some dirt in a big box and compact it and then uh, artificially have different types of rain, sort of artificial, you know, experimental rain and see what the drainage patterns would look like? I saw an article that talked about that once where they had sprinklers and, um, um, you know, did their own little erosion mountain pattern. And one of the things that they did was they raised the sea level up and then dropped it. And when they did, they had a canyon, which if you look at it, you go, whoa, that looks like the Grand Canyon. Um, I wish that I had written down the name of the article so that I could show you the picture. Unfortunately, I can't. All I can say is I saw it and it just, it, it rather stunned me as to what the drainage pattern looked like. Ariel's been pointing these out to us for decades and, and now we have a, a doctoral student who's doing a dissertation on a small part of that with the hope of getting it into the standard literature. And, and there's vastly more of this kind of research that can be done. Um, even the, you just take the, the grand staircase in Utah, the layers are, are eroding down in a stair step fashion over many, mi many miles. And um, you know, rivers and things, they cut canyons with, with a cliff on either side or a high place on either side. They don't cut stair steps. Uh, they only go one way. So, you know, there's... You're talking about like sheet flooding that just is taking out a whole There's got to be something like section. that. Section. Yeah. So there's, there's much work that can be done. Uh, just one comment. Uh, we're talking, we'll be talking about rates of erosion next week, but uh, I think we need to point out uh, to you folks, uh, you know, in the Ham and uh, Nye debate, Nye raised the question about these erratic boulders in Washington and uh, wondered why, you know, how, if you're going to have a gravity sorting, you know, and I... I uh, I don't know of anybody that, uh, anymore now. Yeah, creationists about 40 years ago used to talk about gravity sorting for the geologic column. Uh, uh, I don't know very many that, that follow that at present. Uh, uh, sedimentologically, that it makes no sense. But uh, we probably should uh, point out that. Uh, the Bratz flood is considered by, by most creationists to be a post-flood phenomenon. The other things that you showed are considered to be flood uh, phenomena. So you, you may want to make that, that difference. Uh, they both illustrate some resistance to uh, the flood model, uh, which is probably the basic question we're asking about here. Well, I think it's not only resistance, it's also just sheer uh, blindness. I mean, this, uh, after the Brett's flood, <coughs> flood or floods, whichever it turns out to be, was or were discovered, um, it seems like what geologists should have done is said, well, I wonder if so, there's some other formations that, that, that have the same, uh, same mechanism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they did look, and they found some in Siberia, but they were all looking at the edges of an ice, age, uh, ice sheet. And uh, it seems to me that, that in Idaho in particular, uh, Box Canyon just stands out as being one that you ought to look at. 
But it took them 50 years to even look. And once they looked, it was obvious. So I think that there's not just so much a, a, a resistance, although I, I think that that's pretty much dead now that the Brett's floods are accepted. There is also a, 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 you don't see what you don't know could happen. Uh, I, I, I just would comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just just to finish up, uh, water tables. There are about dozens of these water tables out in geology departments around the countryside. One of the biggest one being is Colorado State University, uh, and uh, they do very interesting experiments on those things. And some of them, uh, like the goosenecks uh, argument, whether that was slow or fast. Uh, demonstrate that, hey, the goosenecks had to be cut rapidly and... Uh, because if you try to cut them slowly, it yeah. doesn't work? Uh, right. You build up, you build up uh, material on the inside of the curve and you, cr and you, you wrote out the outside of the curve. Goosenecks were cut rapidly. Uh, Do you have a reference for that? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Uh, okay. Let's see, well, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. It doesn't come to mind right now. No, I've got reference on that. So. Yeah, it would be very and interesting it, uh, to see. Uh, and just to finish one other comment, uh, just be patient for me one thing. Uh, these erratic boulders in the Brett's Flood uh, are, are considered to be put there erratically, I mean, by <laughs> catastrophically, and that, of course, fits very much with the flood. Uh, uh, model uh, per se, they're, they're up to, you know, huge boulders, uh, 20 feet in diameter, some of them, uh, that you have out there lying in the middle of where uh, it's flood, but it's probably a catastrophic flood after the Genesis flood. Go ahead. I think I watched a different Ham and Nye video than everybody else did, because it seemed to me like um, Nye just went ad hominem, ad hominem, attack, attack, mock, mock, all the way through and had very little science. And it seemed to me like Ken Ham at least tried to be a gentleman. I don't know, I'm not a fan of Bill Nye, I don't know anything about him. It's the first time I've ever seen mm -hmm. him do anything, but it didn't seem like he had answers to anything, but he had a lot of mockery. Like, well, if you were out in the real world, you would see this. If you did what real scientists do, you would see this. And I found it very annoying to watch. <laughs> Second thing is, that, that's just my perspective. Um, whether their science was any good or not, I'll leave you to figure that out. But I would never have accepted that kind of a debate by students in my classroom. Um, the second thing is, I was wondering what exactly you're planning to do with this information. Because as I see kids going through kindergarten through graduate school, a lot of what they're doing is reading textbooks that they have to memorize stuff for, for a test, and their interest is getting through and getting the degree so that they can go out and practice whatever profession it is that they're going into. And we say, well, they go to the college and university because we're going to teach them how to think and we teach them new stuff to them and persuade them that because they now believe what we believe, they now know the truth mm -hmm. and they're critical thinkers. And I think we're missing the point of how to teach critical thinking at any level. Um, and I think if we want to have all Adventist scientists do this, uh, that we need to figure out a way to present it to them that is exciting and fresh and new, that has maybe videos or whatever, something to entice them, that this is another way other than what you're learning in your textbooks. Because to them, the truth is the textbook. And they know that because they had to memorize it for the test. Uh, the theory of uniformity Uniformism. Uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism. If you fly east from here and look down from the plane, you see erosion and alluvial fans. Must have taken a lot of water to make some of those alluvial mm -hmm. fans. It's not happening today, is it? Where did the water come from? 
Well, it's very interesting because um, the current model is actually, I think, flash flooding. Uh, rain every 50, 100 years or something like that gets up into the hills and just washes everything down. Um, we have some evidence for that actually here in Loma Linda, um, except for man's ability to, to get rid of this stuff afterwards. Uh, for a while we had two or three feet of silt running down Mountain View Avenue, for example, where a flash flood had overflowed the, uh, the little dam that they have near Huldergrooks Park and it just put uh, several feet of, uh, well, probably two or three feet of, of uh, uh, <coughs> mud that, you know, would harden to, uh, to, to dirt, which is not that much different from the dirt that uh, we have now. And so you can do this with um, a little bit of water over a long period of time, or you can do it with a lot of water over a short period of time. And sometimes it's hard to make the differentiation. <coughs> and what's even worse is that if you've always been told it's a little bit of water over a long period of time, then you start accepting that this is the model that works. And that's your kind of your paradigm. And sometimes, the paradigm may itself be off. And so you apply it to everywhere and you find out that it isn't actually the way things work. Um, I guess I could give one example um, of, a, of a possible overturning of a paradigm that does more than just argue about one little area. The Tapete Sandstone has been felt to be deposited by a shallow sea for some time. There is now some literature, uh, some papers that have gotten into the peer-reviewed literature that argue that, in fact, it was deep water and it was done rapidly um, because of various things having to do with quartzite boulders that have been knocked off of a quartzite that's sticking up because of uranium uh, isotopes that, that uh, or uranium, uh, uranium minerals that are oxidized in a particular fashion that argues for deep rather than shallow water. Um, and the Tepe sandstone has been used to show that a whole bunch of other formations are um, are shallow water deposits also. Well, if the Tepe sandstone isn't, then all those other ones have to be reevaluated. And it raises the question of whether the whole thing is deep water. Um, and of course, deep water would fit better with the flood, the base of a flood being uh, in the deep water, and then as time goes on, more and more shallow water and, and then uh, terrestrial deposits put on top of it. Um, the papers that I referred to uh, were written by uh, Art Chadwick and Elaine Kennedy. Um, so, uh, I guess I would say there's a lot of geology that needs to be reevaluated <laughs> critically. And, and of course, that's what we try to teach kids to do, is to do critical thinking. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you wanted to comment on that? <laughs> well, I don't know where we're teaching it. <coughs> I don't think we are. We're teaching them that what the textbook says is the truth, and when, that, when you show them an alternative version, <coughs> then they either make fun of you or they're so shocked by it because they've never heard it before. And, uh, and when we say we're teaching critical thinking, all we're doing is changing their minds from what they already knew to what we now think. Um, I, I, I don't unfortunately know have to agree with you. Uh, uh, I don't think we <coughs> teach as much critical thinking as we think we do. I don't think we do either. <laughs> And I see that as I see students, and it doesn't matter if they're science students or English students. If they write yeah. papers for me, they're not using <coughs> critical thinking. Uh, yes. I, we I, have I three comments. Yeah. One, two, three. Uh, in, way in the back for the uh, third one. Wendell, oh, Go ahead. 
One little ray of hope on, on uh, your question, which I think is, is very appropriate. Uh, at least, you know, the denomination has gone into a multi-million dollar by design uh, textbooks for elementary schools from uh, one to eight, anyway. Uh, and uh, they, in, the, in presenting that, they, they, they claim their approach is critical, not dogmatic in the by design, and they do include uh, a very much, uh, it's it's put out by Kendall Hunt, which is a Catholic publisher, but uh, they're uh, putting out uh, an Adventist version of these books that approach uh, this whole sci elementary science program from a uh, uh, creationist perspective in general. So I, I think there's a, a lot of hope there in terms of your question. If they follow what they s claim they've done, and that that is supposed to be very critical, uh, volumes one to six are out already, and uh, seven and eight should be out uh, by this summer. Uh, some of our teachers are already using it. So uh, hopefully that it's what it, they say it is. Go ahead and pass the mic up to Lanch. No, no, we, we, want your, we want you for the internet, too. Go ahead. Uh, I hiked up uh, Steamboat Rock up in Washington there a couple of years ago. It's over 1,000 feet up, and it's a bunch of basalt layers, which is a very different kind of rock from this big erratic boulder I found on top, which may, weighs many tons, and it's granitic. And the only granitic sources for that thing to come from the east uh, in, the, in that big flood would be Idaho or Montana, which is several hundred miles away. So we're talking about a very powerful flood, very definitely. Could theoretically come from British Columbia too, but. Uh, it'd be a different, totally different direction. And, and yeah. Probably not. Um, mm. Yes. Well, I was just going to do a follow-up comment. It, when kids are presented with, with alternate views, they t typically are not necessarily shocked or, or ridiculed. They'll just ask, is this going to be on the test? And that's what determines <laughs> 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 whether they consider it relevant truth or not. <laughs> Which means that teaching kids critical thinking is not going to be easy because they don't want to. Or at least some of them don't want to. Some of them just want you to tell them the truth. And they'll learn it, and then they'll regurgitate it on the test, and then when they're done, they're done. Uh, so it's a problem. It's a multifaceted problem. It's, it's easy to blame, oh, the teachers are no good, or oh, the students are no good. The truth of the matter is it's a combination of both, and sometimes uh, it's, the parents get involved too. What are you teaching my kid? Uh, and the pastor too, yes. Well, um, you know, it's better if people just don't think and they, and they stay in the same ruts and then we can just have the church going the way it is. Um, getting out of ruts is really scary because you don't know where you're going to go. The ruts are kind of nice to guide you. Of course, if they guide you in the wrong place, then that's a whole different story. Yes? Having spent uh, between 10 and 15 years on a school board, attempting to get critical thinking into the curriculum, I found that the resistance was really quite profound on trying to do that from both the parents and the faculty. Um, presented in books, presented in methodologies, tried very hard to try and get that. Because when I interviewed successful people that I ran across in my business and practice, and asked them a question, what skill set would you like your high school student to exit high school with? What made you a success, general managers of Boise Cascade, people of that level, Hewlett Packard, et cetera. And they described for me what they wanted. Primarily, they wanted critical thinking skills in their students. And yet, to try and convince our system to try and focus on that a little bit was extremely difficult. I don't know why it was so hard, but I found it almost impossible to um, get any enthusiasm or any response in the effort to do that. And I feel that's a problem for us because then we lose our students when they go to the public university and they're presented with other facts 
that are dogmatically presented to them, they fail to have the critical skills to question what they were just told so dogmatically. And I'm afraid it's costing us an awful lot of people's faith, a lot of our young people's faith. Uh, comment here and then Ariel, yes. I just finished teaching a class and one of the books was a book on critical thinking and the stu this was a master's level class and the student said to me, why weren't we ever taught this anyplace else before? And the second thing is that if you get people one on one, I think that, that more of us are questioners and critical thinkers than we even realize we are. We just don't apply it very well. Um, it's just we're all in sort of this kind of quandary together. But then, in addition, I think that you hit on something. I think the system itself, the American educational system, mitigates against any kind of critical thinking. And particularly, we're starting out now in elementary school teaching that this is the only thing you're going to learn. We do not want any creativity in this classroom. We want you to be able to meet the standards, and that's it, nothing else. Um, OK. Well, I guess you've got the mic, and then we'll hand it to Ariel afterwards. Yes, well, Dr. Bottomer has just walked out the door. But I wanted to comment on <laughs> something he just said, um, that it's our students who get into college ill-equipped to deal with the questions that they are encountering. Um, I would like to emphasize that we have to start much earlier than college years. The book that Ken Ham was co-authored three or four years ago is titled Already Gone and he quoted at length research on on teenage students and uh, the conclusion was that that most students in this age group reach a settled state of conviction and and uh, well belief by age 14, and if you try to get at them after that, they've already made up their minds, especially when it comes to things like faith and Bible and, and God and morality. So we really have to get at our very much younger than college ale, boys and girls. Ariel Roth, go ahead. Just a couple comments. Uh, reference to Dr. Brand Stater's just comment. Uh, I rejoice that this new Seventh Day Adventist series starts with Grade One. Uh, I've looked at the Grade One book. I I'm shocked, uh, simply because of its sophistication. It seems to me the reading is above Grade One level. It's a great big thick thing, uh, and so on. But uh, if it's what they say it is in terms of wanting critical thinking, that that is a step very much in the right direction. And I hope our teachers adopt that book, uh, that series of books in our schools. Uh, the uh, other comment is uh, what almost better environment could you have for trying to discuss critical thinking but this battle between creation and evolution. Evolution is in all the textbooks, you know, history, whether it's history or uh, anthropology or uh, uh, psychology, uh, evolution is there, uh, and so on. Uh, this is an ideal thing. It's, it's all there in the textbooks. The Bible says something entirely different. The Bible is by far the world's most popular book. Uh, you've got, you've got a, a good mechanism there for initiating critical thinking, which is true. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, before we go to the next question, um, I, I should just point out that one of the things I was struck with in the uh, Nova reconstruction of the mega flood that was obviously an actor, not uh, J. Harlan Bretz himself, but uh, that it that the, one of the reasons it was rejected, the Bretz floods, 
was because it sounded too much like the biblical flood. Uh, I don't know if you caught that on the way through. But I, I thought it was interesting that Nova would point that out. Yes? It seems to me that we need to create atmospheres in classrooms where students are not only allowed but encouraged to ask questions. And sometimes their questions won't be exactly about in line with what we hope they'll think at the end. But that if we don't allow them to ask questions and don't encourage them to do so that they don't learn to think for themselves and therefore they believe nothing. Well, I think there's an even more important point is if you don't allow those questions, they don't go away. They just get stuffed and the, and the student thinks the teacher doesn't know and he doesn't want to or she doesn't want to tell me. Or there's something dangerous about my question. Yeah. And so what happens is that then somebody else comes along and says, oh, that was a wonderful question. And here's the answer. Those people will go, oh, see, my teacher didn't know what uh, he or she was talking about anyway. So I, I think you're right. I don't think we can afford to stuff questions. Because if we do, we are actually creating what we're trying to avoid. I agree with you. Um, there's a question in the back. A comment? Well, um, what I'd say is um, there, I think there needs to be some caution here in that I think some people take um, sort of enjoyment in, in being critical um, and questioning beliefs, but at the end of the day, it's just cynicism. Uh, and I, I think cynicism isn't, real, isn't a genuine search for the truth, but I think uh, critical thinking, if, if it applied correctly, uh, can be you know, invaluable to, to a genuine search for truth. And I think you're right. I think the one thing is that if uh, the people who don't respond to genuine questions will turn people cynical. I think it's important for if I may speak up here. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to give you a chance to record it here. It doesn't come out as well in the internet if, if you speak extemporaneously. Well, I think it's important for us to make a clear distinction between critical thinking and skeptical thinking. Because I've heard lectures from Adventist speakers and um, even at the general conference in Atlanta some years back in which there was such a, an effort made to give a balanced a critical re review of a subject that people around me in the audience were left confused with their confidence and faith shaken, not knowing what to think. So I don't know how to do this, but we need to, to uh, bring out of our critical thinking certainly a, a conviction that will lead us in a, in a biblical direction. Going back to the Brett's uh, floods and the other floods that the geologist generally recognizes having occurred, what about dating of these fl floods? Do they date to roughly the same time point or are they dates all over the place? Uh, that gets very interesting. It depends on how, which dating method you, you use. Um, I was at a lecture where a guy from the uh, University of Idaho was talking down here in um, uh, the San Bernardino County Museum some years ago. And he was talking about uh, the Bonneville flood, which is another Lake Bonneville. Um, apparently overflowed its banks at one point uh, and uh, cut a, a path through Red Rock Pass. And, emptied a whole bunch of water down the Snake River. And you can find all kinds of interesting stuff. If you go to bigfloods.com, they actually have uh, something on the Lake Bonneville flood that uh, would be very interesting, I think. Um, that, that, whole, uh, that whole website is just, just fascinating to, to look at. They have some videos that are fairly well done. Not quite as good as the Nova one, but you know, 
uh, if you're on a cheap budget, why you have to <laughs> cut some corners, it's still worthwhile. Um, but what the, the event that is supposed to have triggered the Lake Bonneville overflow is a lava flow that diverted the Big Bear River from flowing into the Snake River in the north to flowing into what, is, uh, what was then Lake Bonneville in the south, adding extra water and allowing the, the water to come up high enough to overflow at Red Rock Pass. And um, they dated that, they dated that uh, lava flow at first by carbon-14. They found some vegetation that had been scorched by the lava flow, so it kind of made sense to, to um, use that for carbon-14 dating as to how old the uh, lava flow was, and it was about 35,000 years, conventional radiocarbon date. Uh, then somebody decided to date the lava flow itself, and by potassium argon, it was 250,000 years. Quite a bit of difference there. Uh, and um, so the lecturer was proceeding to say, well, now, now what do you do with the carbon-14 date? And he said it was spring deposits. Uh, spring deposits meaning apparently vegetation that again caught in uh, water that had flowed underground and then flowed up against the underside of the uh, of the lava flow and stuck there. So it was quite a bit younger than the actual lava flow itself. Um, of course, left unexplained is why flowing against a cold lava flow would scorch uh, vegetation, but, uh, you know, we're trying our best to explain everything and fit everything together, so that's what they did. Uh, after the meeting, I asked, well, you know, do you suppose that the, uh, that the potassium argon date could be off? Because we have documented dates in the Hawaiian Islands of, you know, flows of 2 million, uh, 44 million years. Maybe this is just... Uh, retained argon, and the uh, carbon-14 dates are closer to the truth. And uh, he said to me, you know, you may be right. I never thought of that before. <laughs> what about uranium dating of this uh, granitic rock on top of the basalt formation that somebody mentioned? Uh, I'm sure that it would have the same uranium date as the granite from which it was taken. Which, of course, doesn't give you its emplacement. Exactly. Well, I guess um, at this point, uh, it looks like we've uh, pretty much finished. And um, you are encouraged to come next week. And we're going to try to get through. Um, Erosion and uplift, and uh, all in uh, 40 minutes or less. 45. <laughs> 45. <laughs>